So um, today what I'll do is, uh, uh, as uh, Rodolfo actually outlined, um, is I'll start by introducing um, how I think about pathological cardiac remodeling, um, do a bit of review on the scaffold protein M8 muscle echinase and green protein beta um, that my lab has been studying now over 20 years, um, and then give a brief uh, presentation of some more recent data relating to MAK beta regulation of class 2 HDAX, and then finish off with, um, which will segue right into um, a little bit of our translational interest. Uh, my disclosures is that I am a chair of the board of um, a pair, uh, sister companies, uh, Anchored Risk 3 Inhibitors, LLC, and Cardiac Risk 3 Inhibitors, LLC, that are developing biologics based upon this research. Um, so this, is, uh, this introduction is, is very basic, but it, it really is to set a platform for a common discussion. Um, and um, just starting with first principles, the heart is a pump uh, with uh, the major chambers being the right and left ventricle um, that are pumping blood to the systems and to the lungs um, respectively. And, and the major cells of the heart, um, uh, the, the biggest cell of the heart is the cardiac myocyte that even though it's about a third of um, the number of cells actually makes up the majority of the mass of the heart. So when we look at muscle, we, we focus or uh, we see very clearly the myocytes um, and in fact, the myocytes determine um, the overall structure of the heart vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis how big the chamber is, both in, in wall thickness and in diameter. And during, this is a smart pump such that in physiologic stress, whether it's pregnancy or strenuous exercise, the pump will adapt over time um, with growth of the cells, non-mitotic growth. There is essentially no proliferation of cells of cardiac myocytes uh, in the heart. Um, and you'll end up with either a mildly centric or concentric hypertrophy that generally tends to be pretty close to a symmetric um, increase in width or length. One can, it can vary a little bit depending on the exact exercise, and et cetera. And this is thought to be compensatory because when you increase the width of cardiac myocyte uh, with parallel addition of sarcomeres, you decrease wall strength. And this is the classic uh, law of Laplace. Um, and when you increase the length, you add serial addition of sarcomere so that in fact your sarcomere, your individual sarcomere length stays around that optimal two micron length um, and allowing you to have large diastolic volumes without overstretching um, the sarcomeres individually. And this is all reversible and this is all very nice. Um, and, but in disease where you have pressure overload or volume overload, examples would be high blood pressure, valve disease, or myocardial infarction and uh, dilated cardiomyopathies you get a tremendously asymmetric growth where you get concentric hypertrophy where width is dominant or eccentric hypertrophy where length is dominant. Um, you know, they can incorporate like an eccentric hypertrophy that could be a little bit of change in width one way or the other, but these are really very asymmetric growths. Now that too is thought to be compensatory from a structural perspective, but the problem is that in disease, um, the cardiac hypertrophy is concomitant um, almost invariably with abnormal myocyte function, whether we're talking about excitation contraction coupling or metabolism, uh, myocyte death where we have apoptosis and necrosis. I leave off autophagy here because that can really be positive or negative depending on the situation. Um, and then myocardial interstitial fibrosis. Um, and the idea is that in disease, uh, cardiac hypertrophy, whether it's concentric or eccentric, um, tends to be irreversible. And in fact, is a major risk factor for heart failure um, you can end up with heart failure of one or two types. You can end up here in the, the bottom right where you have e uh, eccentric hypertrophy and heart failure reduced ejection fraction. That's the classic big heart on the x-ray. Um, person with a heart attack comes in, the heart is dilated and it's the weak balloon. Or today we, people are very interested in HEFPEF where instead of going from high blood pressure to concentric hypertrophy over to eccentric hypertrophy, um, particularly in uh, elderly women with metabolic disease, you could end up staying in a concentric um, hypertrophy mode with lots of diastolic dysfunction and still have heart failure. And this, of course, uh, leads me to remind you um, that heart failure is not low ejection fraction, uh, which we sometimes see in papers we review, but heart failure is, in fact, cardiac dysfunction re resulting in dyspnea, fatigue, and fluid retention. And if you want to say that your mice have heart failure, you really do need to measure something besides your echo. Um, the th reason this is so important is that uh, with current uh, therapy, and we do have good therapies for HEFREF, but even despite modern therapy for HEFREF, um, the mortality for HEFPEF and HEFREF is about still half within five years of diagnosis. Um, they now comprise uh, about equal numbers of the population in developed countries. Um, and uh, you know, clearly um, we're interested in developing new therapies given uh, the significance in morbidity and mortality. 
Um, so this is a, uh, a slide that's a little bit dated now. It's from 2013 from the Mokentine lab. And it, it gives a schema for intracellular signaling pathways within the cardiac myocyte um, that in a cell autonomous manner um, lead to pathological cardiac remodeling. And because of the significance of the disease process, as you might imagine, if you can think of the molecule, somebody's trying to target it. And so um, at the top, we have the beta blockers um, and ACE inhibitors that are really the mainstay of therapy today. But people are thinking about all sorts of uh, uh, new therapies, um, and, you know, whether it's attacking cyclic nucleotides over here, which uh, Rodolfo and I have a shared interest in, um, or whether um, people are thinking about gene therapies that we'll touch on uh, related to other molecules. Um, and so that uh, leads to what exactly is my lab doing? And actually, Rodolfo uh, actually uh, verbalized it quite well. Um, you know, what my lab is interested um, at a mechanistic level, and it, fundamentally I come from a cell biology and biochemistry background, is that I'm interested in what are the signaling pathways that regulate pathologic uh, myocyte hypertrophy, um, and in particular, how they organized. Um, and, you know, this issue of um, having what is the structure and the architecture of the signaling network that has been defined so well over the years. Um, and secondarily to that, are there specific enzyme isoforms that differentially contribute to hypertrophy? And we'll get into that a bit more. But really the idea that um, in a family of enzymes, there might be one specific isozyme that is in partic particularly important to remodel that may give us um, a, a particular perspective and, and a, a unique mechanism um, that uh, would be a, both of basic science and translational interest, which segues to that if we do intensive basic science and we really derive mechanism, um, can in fact that inspire uh, new therapies so that we're devising new therapies um, from a bottom-up approach where we really do um, understand mechanism and we come at it from a rational design. So, and what I would like to add to the schema then are going to be scaffold proteins and enzyme isoforms that together assemble unique multimolecular signaling complexes. And these, which uh, I, I can't claim to be the person who, who coined the word signalosome, but um, the idea that there are going to be uh, solid state chemistry with, mul with multiple um, proteins coming together that in fact serve just like computer processors to regulate cellular process. So what are we talking about? Well, when we were uh, in college, uh, freshmen, uh, we, we took our, our first chemistry class. We may have seen some of this in high school even. And everything um, at that point was about the primordial soup. It was about molecules floating around in solution where um, kinet the chemistry is limited by mass action. How much do you have of a particular um, chemical that's going to react to form a product? Um, things are going to be diffusion limited. It's going to be about um, michaelis menten kinetics when it comes to enzymes, because it's going to be how much does your enzyme bind to substrate? Um, what's its turnover? It's all about things freely floating. Um, and that works really well. In fact, it's allowed us to come up with many drugs over the years and to explain a lot of um, biochemical pathways um, and really is the basis uh, for most of modern drug discovery. <clears throat> but but it turns out that a lot of signaling uh, within the cell is not freely um, diffusible, soluble chemistry, but in fact um, is more like my laptop computer where things are soldered down on organelles, uh, soldered down on motherboard, um, like computer processors and computer chips, where things are in a solid state, where in fact the signaling molecules are brought together by scaffolds in a computer, it might be silica, in, in a cell that's going to be a large protein perhaps. And the proteins, the signaling molecules are going to be Put together in a particular conformation that then allows them to work as an efficient machine or a signal zone. And as soon as you go from the liquid state to the solid state, um, you change all of the mathematical modeling, you change all of the thermodynamics and kinetics. And so um, when you put things together, you immediately accelerate their kinetics, you can amplify their responses, you confer specificity and catalysis that would not be conferred by the active site because now things are physically put together. It allows you to put things in particular locations that might be a particular interest to that pathway. And of course, it allows you to build feedback loops that are very intricate because things are um, put together in different combinations. And I would argue that scaffolding is really important for two particular types of, uh, of proteins, ones that are really low in abundance, where the protein is so rare, it might be very difficult to even think it's expressed. But if you put it right, an enzyme right next to its substrate, um, then in fact, you will get the reaction regardless of the concentration of the substrate and the enzyme. And the other case would be actually um, like PKA that really inspired this field in many ways, uh, an enzyme that has broad substrate specificity and that if you didn't tether it down next to its substrates, it would just phosphorylate anything and be very promiscuous. 
So scaffolding and solid state chemistry can be very helpful, particularly for enzymes that you want to express low in abundance, where you might in fact dedicate that enzyme to a specific function, or ones where you really need to confer specificity because they lack intrinsic specificity. Now, if we're talking about how we want to study um, this type of signaling, or as you know, one person's uh, mechanistic study is another person's therapeutic, there are two general ways you can go about this. One is that once you've identified a signalosome, you could just get rid of the scaffold protein. If you get rid of the scaffold protein, now the components are freely floating, and all of that um, mechanistic advantage by bringing things together uh, within a solid state, uh, semi-solid state, would then um, be gone. And in fact, you would, you would inhibit the function of signalism altogether. And that's the functional equivalent of going into your computer and taking a screwdriver and wrenching off the processor. And I will remind you that in your computer, you have many, many chips that look certainly like to me, I'm not an electrical engineer, but if you remove the computer processor, one sole chip, that computer just becomes junk. And so, um, in this case, getting rid of a scaffold for a particular signal zone, even if it's a rare thing, could have profound uh, physiologic consequences. The other way to go about it is, and perhaps um, a little more interesting, is to compete uh, the binding of a particular component to the signal zone, and now you've essentially changed the wiring of that signal zone, and you could potentially result um, in a different result from upstream signals, uh, depending on what you're interested in. So the Scaffold protein that my lab has spent the majority of its time studying um, uh, for the last 20 some years, I cloned it as a postdoc in John Scott's lab, uh, obviously very indebted to my postdoctoral fellowship with John, um, is a large protein called muscle kinase acrylene protein, um, otherwise known as ACAP6. Um, it comes in two alternative splice forms, an alpha and a beta. The way I got into the, the eye and the retinal ganglion cell was because it turns out MACAP alpha is expressed in the eye. MACAP beta is expressed in striated myocytes um, in, uh, in both skeletal muscle and the heart, the heart being uh, our major focus. It's a very large molecule, around 250 kilodaltons, um, and it binds 20 plus molecules. And uh, this is where I can do a sales pitch for signaling and signal zones, particularly this one, because we have kinases, we have phosphatases, we have phosphodesterases, we have transcription factors, we have uh, other scaffold approach, we have ubiquitination machinery, we have, even have an ion channel. So if you like signaling, uh, this signalism has something for you. And what's interesting about it is that every single one of these molecules are molecules that other people had previously defined as being involved in stress. So this really seems to be a signaling um, hub for stress signaling in the cardiac myocyte. Um, and, and just to um, be clear, uh, we have only seen it at the nuclear envelope uh, in cardiac myocytes. It appears to be there uh, constitutively. Um, uh, and, we, and it appears to be only expressed in differentiated myocytes. So despite uh, early findings um, that uh, MACAP might be in other, uh, on other organelles like the sarcoplasmic reticulum, as far as we can tell, it's pretty exclusive to the nuclear envelope. Um, so over the years, we've defined a series of signaling modules. And this is where I need to say that um, MACAP binds lots of things. Um, but we don't think that they all bind at the same time. And an ongoing interest in the lab um, that I hope we will get uh, more insights over the coming years is what are the combinations of molecules that are bound to this smart computer chip at a single time? Because we know already that some molecules are bound constitutively and some molecules are mount, bound conditionally. And so that leads to the concept that the signalism will have different functions um, at different times and under different pathophysiological physiologic uh, conditions. The first um, sig uh, signaling module that was defined, um, and then there's some representative papers uh, listed, uh, really relates to cyclic AMP signaling, because uh, muscle kinase anchoring protein beta gets its name because it was discovered for its binding of PKA. And it's been really fun over the years, uh, and a lot of this work has been, been done in collaboration with Kimberly Dodge Kafka. Uh, Kim and I have been collaborating for two decades. Uh, we still talk multiple times a week. Um, share grants together, um, and uh, she really um, has been, uh, you know, has contributed in a huge way to, to these particular concepts, um, where she discovered um, the first phosphodesterase to bind to an ACAP, PD43. And, you know, in, in collaboration with her and others, um, including John, um, over the years, we've discovered um, a series of uh, uh, feedback loops and feed forward loops such that um, when leads to the prediction that at MACAP signalosome, cyclic AMP will be very um, much locally regulated. And in fact, um, MACAP is uh, one of the first signalosomes that would include the ability to make, use, and degrade cyclic AMP all locally. 
And uh, there was a wonderful meeting um, actually in London um, this past fall where now Martin Losey and others are talking about how cyclic AMP is regulated within nanometers of its, of its uh, um, production. And this is a great example of where you have the ability to literally have a truly um, localized uh, signaling system with intricate control that would be separate from cyclic AMP elsewhere within the cell. Um, so moving on, um, MACAP signalosomes also can respond to hypoxic signaling. This was a paper from John Scott's lab, uh, where he showed that HIP1 alpha is regulated by hypoxia and normoxia, so leading to regulation of HIP1 alpha. Um, I'll talk a bit today about phosphonosidide signaling. This is a project um, that started as a collaboration with Alan Smirka, and he really contributed um, in a huge way to the literature uh, with his seminal paper in Cell, where he talked about a novel Golgi PI4P um, signaling pathway. Um, and we have expanded um, with him uh, on regulation of HDACs. Uh, and so I'll talk more about that later, so I'll come back to this. Um, another module relates to calcium. One of the first binding partners for MACAP was the type 2 Reiner receptor, uh, a small subset of Reiner receptors sitting on the surface of the nucleus, uh, bind MACAP and Nesprin, which uh, um, is actually how MACAP finds its way to the nuclear envelope. Um, data accumulated over the years suggests that calcium rate beta uh, the isoform that's responsible for hypertrophy associates with MACAP and could be a downstream effector for local calcium release. Uh, Kim and I have published that uh, calcium beta then regulates both NFAT and MEF2, two key transcription factors uh, related to um, hypertrophy. Again, showing uh, localized signaling. One of the major thrusts of, uh, the ther of the translational work in my lab has actually been revolving around um, a new MAP kinase signaling pathway uh, that's uh, based upon risk 3 an extremely low abundant enzyme in the cardiac myocyte. I won't talk much about that today, but uh, over the years we've published that risk 3 which is this very difficult isoform detected myocytes, um, what I could argue it's barely there, um, is absolutely critical within the cardiac myocyte uh, for regulation of the response to pressure overload um, and even in an inositrate model. Um, but this leads to the general concept then, that MACAP beta complexes sitting on the surface of the nucleus are gonna be responsive to a variety of upstream signals, the sort of signals one expects in pathological cardiac remodeling, such as beta signals, GQ coupled receptors, uh, cytokine receptors, and hypoxia. And then what happens at the surface of the nucleus is that it binds transcription factors, whether it be NFAT, MEF2, HIF1 alpha, and others, um, and even class two HDACs, leading to post-translational modifications that will then affect how they uh, regulate cardiac remodeling gene expression. So we, that is what we think is going on. And then what we've done over the years is to look at basic, basic mechanisms uh, of how this may occur. Um, so I want to now just give an example today of how uh, phosphonostite signaling and regulation of HDACs is organized by um, these signalisms. So very briefly, um, class 2A histone deacetylases have been very well described by uh, many labs, the Olson, McKinsey, Montmini, Yang, Schreber, Satoshima, Bears, and Risto, and Akiran, and others. Um, and it's, they serve as integrators um, for uh, hypertrophic signaling, such that you need to have nuclear export of class 2 HDACs to uh, promote uh, cardiac hypertrophy. And um, the HDAC5 uh, is an um, example, and it is phosphorylated by protein kinase D, which is highlighted in red, because we'll talk about that a little bit, um, as well as SIC1 on sites that leads to its uh, um, uh, nuclear export, the HDAC nuclear export. There's a story about PK phosphorylation that actually promotes this nuclear import. And then Satoshima has taught us that oxidation will also lead to nuclear export. And the general concept is that um, when HDACs are, leave the nucleus, then in fact, then MEF, uh, transcription factors such as MEF2 may promote uh, hypertrophic gene expression. So um, Kim and I have discovered over the years that HDAC4 and HDAC5 uh, associate with MACAP uh, in uh, the adult rat heart, um, as shown here by combing your precipitation. Uh, PKD1 also associates, shown here uh, with overexpression of recombinant proteins, and in fact, they form a ternary complex. So uh, this is sort of a prototypical experiment where uh, we can take myocytes, in this case, neonatal myocytes, we immunoprecipitate um, one component of the complex, knock out the scaffold and show that you only see the modifying enzyme in the presence of the scaffold. Um, really, I have to say I was quite surprised at how well this worked um, because I assumed that enzyme, you know, an enzyme like PKD and HDAC5 uh, would associate um, in multiple compartments. But be that as it may, if you pull down HDAC5, um, then you will pull down PKD from cardiac myocytes, but if there's no MACAP, then 
neither the scaffold or the um, enzyme comes down. And this shows that we can uh, reconstitute the complex um, uh, in COS7 cells by expressing uh, the different molecules. And what's interesting is, in fact, uh, PKD seems to like to make the complex with the HDAC um, and uh, MACAP when it's uh, preferentially when it's activated. Now, uh, it has been shown by many labs that if you add phenylephrine, an alpha adrenergic agonist, to neonomyocytes, you will promote the phosphorylation of HDACs, uh, class 2 HDACs, and their nuclear export. And so here's just phenylephrine showing that we can use a phosphorylic antibody uh, for a couple of the PKD sites, and phenylephrine leads to a robust phosphorylation of HDAC5. And remarkably, if you get rid of the scaffold, you don't get that phosphorylation event in neonomyocytes. Corollary to that is that um, the phenylephrine um, treatment will lead to a increase of HDAC in the cytosol and a decrease in the nucleus. And if you get rid of the MA cap using RNA interference, you block the nuclear export, showing that the scaffold um, is apparently required for the canonical PKD of uh, phosphorylation of the class 2 HDAC and its um, nuclear export. Now, we've mapped the binding site on MA cap for HDAC5. Um, it binds near the end terminus of of the scaffold um, within residues 301 to 500. If you use the peptide 301 to 500, now this is our first anchoring disruptor peptide, as I alluded to before, you can in fact inhibit the association of the scaffold and PKD with HDAC5 in uh, neonatomyocytes. And in fact, um, we can reconstitute the pull down. Now what's interesting, this is sort of an aside, is that we have also shown that MEF2 binds um, the scaffold and it turns out that uh, MEF2D uh, binds a MACAP within the same region as the HDAC. And in fact, their binding seems to be synergistic. Now, whether that's because the MEF2D brings HDAC5 to um, MACAP or whether there's a triangle where they both like to, they like to bind all together um, rather than individually, we haven't clarified. But clearly, this peptide uh, inhibits both MEF2D and HDAC5 association with the scaffold. Um, but what about the HDAC5 phosphorylation? Well, just like we showed that if you get rid of the scaffold altogether, if you put in the peptide to compete the association of the HDAC uh, with the scaffold, we can compete the phosphorylation of the HDAC um, induced by phenylephrine by expressing the peptide. Again, here's phenylephrine leading to HDAC phosphorylation on PKD sites, and now in the present peptide, we don't have that. And as you would expect, that leads to retention of the um, HDAC in the nucleus. And I have to say, you know, when um, th this work uh, in particular was done in Kim's lab. You know, when we saw the data, I, I was really shocked. I did not expect it to be this digital. But I think one of the consequences, and, and perhaps deserves more mathematical modeling, um, particularly with we have Jeff Sossman coming next week to, to speak on Friday. Um, you know, it's a, it, it really, I think, um, underscores that when you have signal zones and you change um, the mathematics of how enzymes and substrates interact, that in fact, you really can get on-off switches. But I have to say, I did not expect it to be this digital. Um, as you would expect, if we then look at hypertrophy, this is just one assay um, in this published data in our favorite journal, JMCC. Uh, uh, if you uh, if give phenylephrine, you get cells that are a little bit uh, wider in cross-section. And if you put in the peptide, you can um, inhibit that phenylephrine-induced hypertrophy. Um, but what about in vivo? So Michael Kreitzer was a very... Um, uh, successful uh, MD-PhD student in my lab. Um, in 2014, uh, he published the conditional knockout of the um, MACAP uh, um, molecule. So this is showing that using the tamoxifen-inducible mercury um, uh, transgene, the, the alpha mycin heavy chain promoted one that gives us cardiac myocyte specific uh, conditional knockout. We can get rid of MACAP. This allows me to remind you that MACAP is only seen in the striated myocytes of the heart, the, the cardiac myocytes. Um, here's the control. Um, he was then, we were then able to look at the role of MA cap in, um, in, in disease. So this is a summary of that published data that at, using two weeks of pressure overload by transverse air constriction, um, the controls get nice wide myocytes. The MA cap knockout has an attenuated hypertrophic response. Um, you can see it here now at 16 weeks later, where the control uh, animals have huge hearts. There's big left atria, so they have both uh, uh, systolic and diastolic dysfunction. Of course, the MA cap knockout heart looks a lot better. And in fact, I say that if you're a mouse and someone's going to tie a ligature around your aorta, you might ask to have your MA cap taken out because, in fact, you will now survive. There was a 
huge survival benefit. Um, looking at the histology, we saw that there was in fact decreased uh, um, apoptosis of myocytes um, at 16 weeks of a pressure overload, as well as decreased collagen content, uh, consistent with a model that MACAP beta is required for induction of uh, pathological concentric hypertrophy early on um, that then evolves into um, a heart failure. But what about the pathway we've just been discussing? So um, Alan Smirka published that there's a, a pathway involving cyclic AMP to EPAC to fossilized species epsilon involving the Golgi that then leads to activation of PKC and PKD. And based upon his prediction, um, we then looked at PKD in the knockout. And, if, and what we found was that whether it be short-term or long-term, this is two-week or 16-week TAC, you see um, activation of PKD in these hearts um, using the philosophist of antibodies for activation sites on the enzyme. And that activation is attenuated uh, when MACAP is gone. And what about um, the HDAC? Um, interestingly, at two weeks and at um, 16 weeks, we did not see activation of HDAC5 in any real dramatic fashion, um, activation being phosphorylation at the PKD sites. But what we did see was at HDAC4, um, uh, there was a detectable induction of the phosphorylation. And uh, to varying degrees, uh, that phosphorylation uh, was significantly attenuated by MACAP knockout. And that correlated uh, with MEF2 specific gene expression that was inhibited. So uh, these data suggest that MACAP beta is important for class two HDAC um, activation um, during uh, pressure overload in vivo and in neonatomyocytes uh, in the model in vitro, uh, it, in part through uh, PKD uh, phosphorylation of HDACs and HDAC D repression of hypertrophic gene expression. Um, these molecules are involved more than just in pressure overload. And more recently, uh, we've been uh, investigating what happens in myocardial infarction, um, a more complicated model of heart failure, but one that is uh, very prevalent um, and, um, and very translationally relevant. Eliana Martinez, um, when she was a fellow in the lab or a junior faculty, she was a research assistant professor, I should say. Um, she brought myocardial infarction lab and in, here's some unpublished data where, again, using the proper controls, here's the mercury mer and the um, flux control. These are all tamoxifen-treated mice. Uh, here's the knockout. Uh, she did permanent ligation of the left coronary artery to induce an anterior infarct. Um, what happens uh, over time in these mice is that the anterior wall thins um, as we get uh, infarct expansion. Um, uh, so that now the uh, echo actually shows a flat line um, where the anterior wall is. Um, and that leads to a decrease in ejection fraction. And in fact, uh, uh, with a uh, um, uh, dilation of the ventricle um, and even in atrial hypertrophy, you start getting back up in towards the lungs. And so um, in these animals, we noticed very quickly, in fact, when, I, when she first showed the data in lab meeting, I said, oh, those must be your sham controls. And she said, no, in fact, this was the MACAP knockout. There was tremendous uh, protection um, against infarct expansion. Um, there was essentially no dilatation, uh, preservation of ejection fraction. And in fact, the atrial hypertrophy was blocked. And when she showed us the tissue sections, it became obvious what happened. Uh -oh. They seem to be frozen. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, uh, here are three sham hearts, um, normal looking left and right ventricle for the two control cohorts, the MACAP knockout. Um, here are two horrible looking hearts that have huge infarcts. Obviously, the MACAP knockout heart looks a lot better. And using strict criteria, the infarct size has decreased about 50%. So, MACAP knockout, uh, which conferred a survival benefit in pressure overload disease, also seems to be hugely beneficial um, in uh, infarction as well. And, and, and by the way, we assume it's not just about HDACs. Uh, as I showed you at the beginning, there's you know, 20 plus molecules that are all involved in remodeling that seem to, at some point or another, uh, interact with the scaffold. And so this is probably explains why there's such a profound effect. But this immediately led to the question, um, if we've identified a signal zone and a reasonably rare protein, and let me tell you, one of the problems with working in my lab is that you have to learn how to do Westerns on rare proteins. It's not easy to see a makeup on a Western. Um, everything is done with BEMPTO ECL, um, and you have to really, you know, it takes a, a month or two for people to get their Westerns tuned up to where they can see staining where there's no staining on a knockout and where they can do a Western and actually show that there's difference between the knockout and the wild type on the Western. Um, it's pretty challenging. Um, but it, it makes it actually a molecule that you might think about translationally, because if you have a molecule that is low abundant, that is related to a particular pathologic process, maybe it's one that you can target with impunity. 
So I've been very, as a molecular biologist, um, is very interested in gene therapy. Um, and in fact, what I liked about the gene therapy vectors was because it also gives us a great way to study mechanism while it's something that becomes translationally relevant very quickly. Uh, so very briefly, um, adeno-associated viruses have really brought gene therapy back to a fore. These are these small 20, 25 nanometer icosahedral single-stranded DNA viruses. Um, they have uh, um, uh, terminal repeats, one at each end, um, and they hold a, a cargo of around uh, 4.7 uh, kilobases. You can, if you're willing to half the cargo, you can delete um, part of one of the terminal repeats, and that will allow you to have increased efficacy of expression and decrease the latency of expression um, with your virus. And so I designed um, a AAV that includes the um, cardiac troponin T promoter, just uh, described by Brent French. Um, so we would have cell autonomous um, uh, expression, um, a MER30 MER cassette for a um, small hairpin RNA that was a new uh, sequence that we rec was conserved throughout species. Um, we went ahead and made the AV9 viruses, AV9 um, capsid uh, being a, a, a capsid that recognizes stridomyocytes uh, as well as liver and other places, but very good for stridomyocytes, um, and then went ahead and uh, expressed this in mice. And it works really well. Um, three weeks after treatment with 5 times 10 11th of IV of virus in the adult um, or control, you can see we get highly penetrant knockout of the virus, uh, of the protein. Um, in on total heart extracts. Um, so how does that work as a treatment for MI? So Ileana um, took eight to 10 week old mice. She randomized them for, uh, I'm sorry, she gave them all uh, permanent ligation of the coronary artery. She echoed them two days later, randomized them like in any good mouse clinical trial, um, injected them then the following day with control or ma cap rna and then followed them out for um, eight, uh, for 56 days. And as you can see immediately from these M mode echoes, um, there was a big difference. Um, so what happened? First off, the anterior wall um, was relatively preserved um, in the MA kept SHRNAs, and you'll see in a minute um, what that means. Uh, but importantly, uh, volume and systole um, did not uh, go through rapid uh, um, increase, uh, so there was less dilatation. And Perhaps most remarkably, um, here are the mice being randomized by ejection fraction um, two days out, so where they have a ejection fraction around 30. Um, they're then treated by 14 days out. You already had restoration of cardiac function, uh, systolic function, um, by the MAKFSHRNA um, that was then persistent while the controls continued to decrease. The numbers up here are the shams that you can see around 55. And that 40 number is a number um, that is often used as, as a break, uh, break point for um, ejection fraction of, of clinical significance. It's the difference between uh, diagnosing HEFREF or not. Um, but what happened uh, histologically? Well, here are the hearts when they were taken out. Um, you can tell which one is the control SHRNA because it's the one that looks the worst. The MAKF SHRNA um, treated hearts, of course, have a divot because this is a permanent ligation. So there is, in fact, an infarct, right? We did not, uh, this is not ischemic perfusion. But you can see already that size of the infarct is dramatically less. And so when you, we do the echoes, we're going along here, um, an, anterior to posterior, and you can see that um, it, that is why the um, anterior wall looks so much better on the um, M mode echoes. Um, now, what happened long term? Um, cardiac hypertrophy was attenuated in the treated animals, um, biotrol weight. Uh, uh, was not is increased, uh, suggests it wasn't as much backup into the lungs. And importantly, pulmonary edema um, was uh, not increased. So here is pulmonary edema, wet lung weight in the control animals, uh, uh, indicative of heart failure. And here we have, in fact, blocked heart failure uh, using the SHRNA. So taken together, um, this suggests that um, following this mechanism, of MACAP signalisms, learning that it's involved in pathologic heart modeling, using the knockout to show that in fact, getting rid of this could work. We then were able to use molecular biology to come up with a tool that gives us at least one way uh, to pursue um, treating a disease as common as myocardial infarction and perhaps uh, blocking infarct expansion and heart failure that's secondary to, to um, this common disease. So I will end there. Um, I have mentioned um, several of the people who have been critical in these studies. Uh, particularly uh, um, uh, Michael Kreitzer and Eliana Martinez. Um, you know, I need to give credit uh, uh, for production of the AV. We've been funded by the NHLBI Gene Therapy Research Program. Um, I've mentioned Kimberly Dodge-Kafka, 
who is a uh, really has been um, a major collaborator over the years. Um, and uh, I think we'll stop there and take questions. Let's see. So we need to find. Thank, thank you, uh, Michael. Okay. Okay. So. In the screen. Okay, so I see the chat. Should I just go ahead and start taking the questions and answering? Yes, but perhaps just stop sharing the screen so that we can, uh, so that the uh, attendees can see. Okay. Okay. Can do Very nice talk, uh, Michael. Very interesting and intriguing. I think now you need to go to the Q&R, a Q&A. Q&R is in French. <laughs> R for response. Okay, so and, soon. And, and, and you will see questions and uh, maybe just um, take question one by one, uh, mentioning the person who asked a question and try to so, answer. So the first question um, by Sina is, can the presence of these scaffold proteins um, impact the action of drugs by sequestering them? Has been implicated in any pharmacogenetic studies? Um, don't know. And no, there haven't been the implication. It's an interesting idea. Um, I would think that given the low level of abundance of a scaffold such as MACAP, it would be hard to get much going on by mass action. That would be my guess um, as far as actually sequestering a drug. Um, certainly, uh, overexpression of phosphodesterases, um, which we heard about recently, um, is, uh, you know, and, and expression of other signaling enzymes has the ability to change, uh, you know, um, uh, the expression of um, signal to second messengers, and I would imagine also affecting drugs, but I don't think the scaffold or an individual complex would have enough mass, but we haven't really looked at that, and I don't think there's any evidence out there. Um, second question by Samsung. I found do evidence. Mind, do, you mind, do you mind if I just interject quickly? Sure, I mean, has ahead. anybody used maybe super resolution imaging to look at the effects of, I don't know, let's say beta blockade or passing channel blockers on, on the, 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 the synod or, you know, on the interaction or the clustering of these um, molecules of the HDACs and ACAPs maybe? Or... So we haven't done anything on the composition of the, of the complex. It's actually an area we're, we're hoping to get into um, as far as that's concerned. Okay. And we, we just don't have the data. Um, we certainly have used live cell imaging to look at signaling. We just published a paper on um, uh, MA cap alpha um, signalosomes in the retinal ganglion cell looking at cyclic AMP dynamics and, and, and the group in Paris has, has done stuff looking using, I mean, there's been multiple groups looking at live cell imaging. So it, it's, but that's more about, I think that's a different question though than, than we're talking about now. Um, okay, do you not think that's related to what uh, Sina was asking? Um, you mean as far as actually sequestering drugs or he was asking about um, impact the actions of drugs by sequestering. Oh, I see, rather than the other yeah. way around. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so Samsung asks, I found evidence of ACAP AC binding disruption using FRET and human ventricular myocytes. My question, how do you expect that AC ACAP disruption affects cyclically? How would this affect beta adrenergic receptors and PD4 signaling? Um, so, okay, wait, it's evidence of disruption using FRET. Um, so I, so, um, so for example, MACAP binds AC5, and if you, it turned out in neonatal myocytes, when we published this in 2009 with Carmen Dessauer, um, if you block, use a peptide to block um, AC5 binding to MACAP, you actually blocked um, negative feedback on the AC5, and in fact, we ended up with sky-high cyclic AMP levels and neonatal myocyte hypertrophy. Um, now, whether that that's because the peptide we used also blocked AC5 binding to other scaffolds. Because by the way, one of the things we have to be clear about these peptides is that they're binding partners for one or either the scaffold or for the enzyme. And so the molecule that blocks the binding of the, of the partner to the scaffold block, could potentially also block the binding of that molecule to other things, right, that binds through a common interface. So I assumed at the time the reason we got sky high levels of of uh, cyclic AMP was because when we blocked AC5 binding to MACAP, we probably blocked negative feedback through other mechanisms as well through a common interface. And so I think you have to be really careful. Um, when you're starting to disrupt things, you have to go back and check what else is going on. Um, 
And as far as beta receptors and PD4 signaling, I, I think, again, you really, if you're, in a, as you play with these things, I think you just have to check um, and, and see what, which feedback loops are disrupted and, and what ends up being um, uh, um, dominant. Um, Vivna asks, are these responses P specific? Did you compare your observations with any other stimuli? Um, it's a good question. So on the HDAC story, I don't think we looked at other things um, other than looking in vivo. Um, I assume it's not albuterinergic specific um, up front. Um, uh, Alan uh, Smirk has published stuff with endothelin. Um, you know, we've looked at, uh, there is an interesting story about beta signaling, um, which uh, I didn't get into because it, it, it's a whole nother aspect of this, but if you give acute beta adrenergic um, signaling, you actually attend, you actually inhibit the nuclear export. So you actually have acute beta adrenergic signaling leads to HDAC retention through a PKA dependent mechanism. Um, but chronic beta signaling, which goes along with this whole, there's this whole other field about remodeling of beta adrenergic receptors and heart failure, then you actually lead to export. So it's, cer so it, it's certainly not phenylephrine specific. Um, do you, let's see, um, Sina asks, um, do you anticipate any long-term effects of MA-cap depletion? Um, let's see, un unable to adequately respond to sympathetic input, it would be interesting to investigate short-term inhibition of MA-cap followed by restoration of protein expression after the acute phase of injury. Um, so we have followed knockout mice for um, at least 18 weeks, and uh, because those are shams and controls and the animals seem to be just fine. Um, we have the ability to phenotype cardiac um, function and structure to the nth degree. And the, if you look very, very carefully at the hearts, you will see a, I don't know, 5% maybe, um, decrease in, in overall heart size um, as MA cap goes out longer. Um, MA cap knockout mouse are protected um, from uh, swimming-induced uh, hypertrophy, um, if you want to call it physiologic. Um, Okay, I mean, some people have issues with swimming as a model. Um, uh, so, but the mice, um, so there, there seems to be a little bit less um, heart weight, um, and it may be, I, I'm, the data suggests that it's, le it's, it's less, cons less growth in width over long term, which would sort of be consistent with other data. Um, but it's pretty marginal, and, and it, it's, it's, it's not something that is uh, certainly anybody would consider a pathologic phenotype. Um, we have not tried. Um, restoring um, MACAP expression. And I'll tell you, part of the problem is that MACAP is expressed at low levels and doing RNI rescue in vivo um, would be challenging, particularly since MACAP's uh, too big for AAV. Um, but it, it's challenging because if you overexpress MACAP um, and that's really easy to do, you will end up with uh, um, molecules being sequestered away from the nuclear envelope and you'll end up with inhibition. Um, Okay. Sorry, my, my colleague, Mike, again, I apologize. Yeah. Mike, can I step in um, on, on this um, comment? The uh, knockout is, uh, is a general knockout? Uh, cardiac, inducible cardiac myocyte specific, tamoxifen, okay. mercury. What happens, um, is it possible to have a general knockout? Uh, uh, are, are mice okay. uh, alive? No, bad. Uh, they look great until they die within 24 hours of birth. Um, so we've actually looked at them. Uh, we did the post-mortem and it wasn't obvious um, what happened. Um, we looked at skeletal muscle um, and just what, it's not obvious. Um, we thought maybe it was a you know, diaphragm issue. Um, there's a paper that came out about MACAP beta and skeletal muscle that it's important for, um, uh, I don't want to misquote it, but I, I believe it was regeneration after injury um, and uh, something to do. Uh, and so, um, Probably not how to make up beta in your skeletal muscle is bad, but also when John Scott and I published the MACAP alpha knockout, it wasn't a knock, it wasn't MACAP alpha knockout. What it was was it deleted the exon um, that makes MACAP alpha. So MACAP alpha has extra 245 amino acids um, on the end terminus of MACAP beta. If you delete the exon that gives you that, then you end up with MACAP beta in the brain. That mouse had failure to thrive. Um, and we've, we've published that if you knock out MACAP alpha altogether in the retinal ganglion cell, um, you will have worse um, effect of, um, you'll have worse neuronal survival after optic nerve crush. So the last thing you want to be doing is knocking out MACAP globally because you, your stroke will be worse, um, your glaucoma will be worse, um, and certainly 
uh, it, there's evidence that you would have issues with your skeletal muscle. So um, it looks like it's a cardiac that, and I think this is a general principle, but molecules don't have agendas. Um, I think you have to be really careful about saying molecule good, molecule bad. Signalosomes are tinker toys. Um, they come together, they form biochemistry. The cell takes advantage of biochemistry to do different things. In the cardiac myocyte, the biochemistry suggests that MACAP signalisms are about the fine tuning of cardiac structure to stress. Um, and that it, it's really about the fine tuning and, and because it's responsive to stress signal, it becomes a problem during disease. In other tissues like neurons, you don't wanna be messing with it because you need MACAP because it really helps keep the neurons alive. At least that's the data we have from retinal ganglion cells. So, yeah. Okay, and I had a related question. Is there any uh, known mutation in humans for MACAP? So, um, Brad McConnell has published some SNPs um, suggesting that there's some um, bio, uh, biochemical differences um, related to binding of phosphodiesterases and such. Um, we have not followed up on that. Uh, there, he said there's, he's got a couple of papers that suggest there will be differences in the way signal integration occurs. Um, but whether or not they're pathologic or not, really, I don't think it's been pursued uh, further than that. Thank but you. I would refer you to his work. Michael, sorry, do you, do you mind if I just interject as usual? I can't stop meddling. <laughs> but, I mean, the re I'm just following up on, on Cena's question about the long-term effects. Because, I, I mean, I do recall the, the work by Ali Alamouche on, the, on protein kinase, um, well, sorry, on protein phosphatase 1 inhibitor, inhibitor 1 and the constitutively active inhibitor one being beneficial short term, but then in mice where chronic overexpression of this protein was induced, they were obviously dying earlier. So I guess it's, it's in relation to probably some of that work as well, the scene is asking these questions. So how far did you take these mice? Did you say no more? So we haven't, so the longest we've gone is, so we've done two things. One, we did the NKX 2.53, which knocks out and make happen development um, in the cardiac mice site lineage. And those mice at a couple months of age were healthy. I mean, there was no real phenotype. Um, so then we've taken, we induced knockout at eight weeks of age. And then we follow, two weeks later, we give sham surgery um, and then follow into the 16th. So that's what, 18 weeks. So we've looked at 18 weeks out and they seem to be healthy. So, so yeah, so again, so it would be quite interesting to see what happens when they're one, one year old and, and longer than that, whether they actually start dropping off. No, agreed. And, and let me tell you, since we're, we're, very, we're clearly um, very interested in this as a translational um, exactly. issue, I mean, it's, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, biotox becomes important, right? Yeah. Um, so um, Jeff uh, Sosterman um, says, very nice talk. To what extent is MACAP expression regulated in development disease? Any known regulators? So... Um, we have not seen, so a MACAP appears to be expressed in the cardiac myocyte. In fact, in, I would, we've never seen it outside of a differentiated cell. Um, and I've, in, in, we've looked most closely in the heart, obviously. I've never seen a MACAP outside of the nuclear envelope, um, no matter what cell, whether it's a neonatal cell or an adult cell, whether it's a stressed animal or unstressed animal. And there is, there, you can find some data that MACAP expression may go up or down 50%, maybe 100%. But nothing, um, you know, nothing that is really substantial. Um, so um, I, I sort of see it as a rock, you know, that it gets expressed um, in, you know, uh, in differentiated myocytes and it sits there. Now, we've never looked at the post-translational modification of MACAP. And this is a project that we're talking about getting underway because... 20 years later, you'd think we would have looked, uh, but we haven't because we've been busy doing other things. Um, but there is no way that this is not post-translationally modified in a significant fashion. Um, and so, you know, but as far as the protein being there, we don't have any data for it moving or doing anything like that. Um, and then as far as regulation, um, I, I think that along those lines, um, I, I, I will be in shock if a 250 kilodot in protein isn't regulated by post-translational modification. Uh, but at the same time, certainly the, some of the binding partners like calcineurin um, is recruited when it's activated. Uh, interesting story there. Um, the phosphodiesterase is, is recruited when it's phosphorylated. That is the phosphodiesterase is phosphorylated, BD43. Um, so there are definitely is regulation of the signalism that we know. Um, okay, so Tom Brand, what is bad about not having a makeup? There must be an advantage to have this gene as otherwise it would have been eliminated 
during evolution. Um, yeah, so um, Craig Emter and I are close collaborators. He's a large animal physiologist, and we talk about this all the time. Um, and uh, first off, clearly bad not to have a makeup in the um, nervous system. And there's the one paper that says, suggests that it would be bad not to have it in skeletal muscle. But what about the heart? Um, so the thing I think about is physiologic hypertrophy. Um, and there, and um, the couple of models that Craig and I have discussed, uh, and we go back and forth, but you know, the data is just not there, is that, um, is that it's possible because MA cap, the loss of the scaffold um, in, inhibited swimming induced hypertrophy, it's very possible that, uh, and we've, I don't think we've tried to make knockout mice, um, the conditional knockout mice, I'm pretty sure we haven't. Um, it's possible that pregnancy would not go as well if you didn't have your MA cap uh, scaffold, because if you didn't have physiologic hypertrophy during pregnancy, I would imagine that would be um, an evolutionary deficit. The other thing um, that is possible is that from an evolutionary perspective, um, it's, you could argue that, you know, animals have to live until adulthood and old enough to get the next generation ready to, to breed. Um, and so um, if you get quote unquote compensatory hypertrophy um, and it's enough to keep you alive, just to get those kids going and you die a heart failure when you're 40, um, from an evolutionary perspective, that's okay. But I got to tell you, um, my postdoc reminded me in lab meeting the other day that evolution is an ongoing process and that evolution is not ended. And that just because something is true today doesn't mean it's evolutionarily has been already selected. So she corrected me and I think she's right. We need to be careful about assuming that evolution has already run its course and that what is true today is actually most beneficial. I tend to think that there should have been some evolutionary pressure already, but, and, and so I, I, I am, at some point, it might be interesting to try to breed the tamoxifen inducible mouse and see what it does um, and see if it makes a difference. But I do not have data. I only have speculations on that. Um, do you have any initial, so Jeff asked, do you have any initial thoughts on why I make a knockdown with substantially reduced infarct size? I assume that would be an effect distinct from reduced hypertrophy. And Jeff, absolutely. So Kim and I are working on a story now um, that uh, we are working on the mechanism. We um, there, there, are two, there are two things that could be happening um, in infarct. Um, one is um, this issue about, um, and, and I think it has to do with infarct expansion, right? So um, I think that what happens in an infarct is that the border zone myocytes are stressed. And because of the um, hemodynamic stresses on them and being near fibroblasts probably that are active, um, that they are basically in hyperdrive on remodeling. And so um, the fact that MACAP was able to block apoptosis and fibrosis and pressure overload suggests that there's um, presumably some inherent protection against cell death and, and stress. And in fact, infarct, um, there's a nice review by Pfeffer that I was just looking at the other day uh, from 2005 um, that talks about the mixture of pressure and volume overload stressors on cardiac myocytes in infarct. It's, it's actually a very much more complicated system. I tend to think of it as a simple model for eccentric hypertrophy, but it's really more complicated than that. And so um, it could be that, and I, and I think what's going on is that I think in pressure overload induced hypertrophy, that in fact, um, the pathways that um, lead to, I, I think at a very early stage in the signaling, um, that the pathways that lead to cell death, that lead to induction of fibrotic genes are probably co-regulated um, by maybe an accident of nature, I don't know, but are co-regulated with growth. And so it's very possible that um, knocking on a makeup, that, that the same pathways that are blocking the, the concentric hypertrophy pathway are also blocking um, cell death and fibrosis, in which case, um, then you don't have the, the loss of the myocytes, you don't lead to infarct expansion. That's a working hypothesis. We're looking at um, MMA-CAP's role in cell um, survival. Um, the initial studies, um, we certainly didn't see an increase in MMA-CAP cell death in vitro and vivo with MMA-CAP SNA or whatever. Um, and so whether it's protective is something we need to look at more. But I, I think it, it's probably a combination of effects, but it's very interesting um, about how this plays, uh, plays out. Um, uh, Julio. Um, so taking the chip out of the laptop makes it resilient to damage? Uh, no, <laughs> that would be bad. Uh, please don't do that to your, your $2,000 laptop. <laughs> uh, also, have you thought about using proximity labeling and mass 
uh, spectrometry to study and make beta signals dynamically? Yes, we have. Um, um, give, it, give us a little bit of time. Um, perhaps some of the components of them can be targeted more specifically. Uh, thanks and greetings from Charm City. Uh, yeah, so um, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, we are definitely thinking about mass uh, spectrometry, mass spectroscopy, um, and proximity labeling. Um, that is the project that uh, we have been talking about getting started. We're trying to get two major stories out the door, and we would like to get our lab reopened after COVID, and then we can actually start thinking about these experiments more in earnest. The time has come to do that sort of work. Um, and as far as targeting uh, components of the signal zone more specifically, um, we are actually targeting two components of the signal zone, in, including especially risk three, um, very aggressively, um, uh, and so, and with remarkable efficacy. And so, yes, um, that's, a, but that's another story for another day. Um, how much of the heart function is dependent or influenced by, must, by myocyte and MACAP versus MACAP expression in non myocyte cells within the heart? Oh, we've never seen MACAP outside the myocyte. And in fact, I think the reason the knockout looks so great on a gel is because I don't think there is a MACAP outside the myocytes. Um, okay, uh, Lulin Roderick, uh, hello. Hi, um, I expect I should know when I make out how much of the effects on calcium via Ryan receptor regulation or if there's a large effect on Ryan receptors. Is there a requirement for X on other targets? So is there a hierarchy? Um, I, this is a, these are studies that are ongoing, um, but I, you know, because of the location of a MACAP, I find it hard to believe that a MACAP has anything to do with regulation of excitation, contraction, coupling directly. I assume that um, this is, uh, that any effects on excitation, contraction, coupling that are palliated by loss of MACAP are through indirect um, ex, uh, mechanisms revolving re regulation of gene expression. I think what's going on is that there are, if, if you think, the way I envision this, and this is purely a speculative model, so, but I will speculate away. Um, if, you, if you are a molecule and your job is to figure out how stressed out the myocyte is, then you would probably want to position yourself next to um, a dyad where there's some random receptors, I'll take calcium channels, what have you, um, where you can sense and smell how much contractility is going on. So you want to be near a sarcomere or two, you want to be near a RAN receptor or two, and you might even want to be near the nucleus where you then can then modulate transcription factors. So I think what's going on, Clara um, Shin Armstrong published a paper showing that there are areas of the nuclear envelope that are very close um, to the plasma where in fact, um, you can have dyads essentially. So I think a MACAP is strategically localized next to RAN receptors, not because its major big deal is to regulate the RAN receptor potentially, but to be actually to sense how much contractility is going on so that then it can um, actually uh, respond and it can take that calcium and then use it to activate um, calcineurin. By the way, uh, before we get too far into this, um, I, don't be I believe that calcineurin is at basal state elsewhere in the cell. And so I think calcineurin has to be activated elsewhere in the cell by other mechanisms that other people describe. And then it then comes to MACAP and then that becomes then a secondary checkpoint for hypertrophy. Um, I don't think the calcineurin is resident on, and I know it's, it's not resident on MACAP, at least in unstimulated cells, neonatal myocytes. cells. Um, so I think that's what's going on. And then I think there is the possibility because PKA is smack up against the RAN receptors that there is potential in this particular case for PK to regulate RAN receptors locally um, without getting into the whole controversy about PK regulation of RAN receptors. So, but I don't think this is about um, proximate regulation of EC coupling. This is not, I don't see this as the Cam Kinase story that Don Bears and others have so elegantly described. But presumably um, you don't see any effects on cardiac contractility anyway in your, in your mice, right? So. Um, certainly not negative. I mean, they, they're doing better, right? So. I mean, but they, right, but the MA, if you take myocytes and knock out MA cap, you don't lose, um, you don't, I mean, the, you do uh, the ionoptics that uh, work up on the myocytes. They're not, they're not in trouble by any stretch. And they certainly, and they do have an isoterinol response. Uh, Mike? So, okay, so, Mike? yeah. Yeah, oh. you just um, went to approximately half of the questions. <laughs> so, I, I doubt that you will be able to answer them all um, before uh, uh, people will disappear from the webinar. So maybe uh, you can go down uh, a couple more and okay. I, don't know if you, I don't know if you want to, to choose some of them. Yeah, I mean, I, 
Yeah, sure, sure. You just, I'm happy to go as long as you want me to. Um, so uh, very quickly, um, the, yes, the reason we wait uh, are, are the mice recovering completely naturally between day two and 14 post MI. Um, to treat animals, we just give them the virus and they get better. Um, thanks is, uh, and then I've already mentioned about it not being other cell types. Um, we have not looked at ischemia or perfusion yet, Frank. Um, we need to do that. Um, uh, Larry, um, let's see. One might expect the number of vital functions would be interrupted by deletion of vision or makeup. Um, we haven't. We haven't seen. We haven't looked at metabolism. Um, we haven't seen any. We just haven't seen adverse effects, but we haven't looked carefully at metabolism for sure. Um, and then I've already talked about physiologic hypertrophy. Um, we've talked about physiologic hypertrophy. Let's see. Um, Oh, um, yeah, so the um, AV, the person asked if the AV was, it was given after. Uh, the knockout was before the AV was after, and they both worked. Um, would it work to the same risk of reactivity is blocked? Um, um, the, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the risk story. The knock, inhibiting risk three is a good thing that the person's asking. We can get it, and then someone else. So I think we're actually done, because the other questions were already asked. Okay, well, this was a great, uh, great talk and great discussion, or at least um, question answers. So thanks a lot, Mike, and uh, thanks uh, Davor for organizing this nice session. And maybe no, you want to have the final words. <laughs> well, I mean, I, first of all, Michael, I would like to thank you. First of all, for volunteering when the when the program was released. Um, well, or when the empty program was released. And, uh, and thank you for, for stepping in and giving a wonderful presentation. And thank you for spending time and answering lots of questions. I know you, you, you would have wanted to answer lots more of them from what I can see. Um, but, uh, but, but it is the 1st of May, so <laughs> we gotta, we got to let the French some time to uh, relax as well. So uh, <laughs> if, if you'd like, I mean, I can save the questions for you um, and then send them over to you as well, but, uh, but equally... There's no, there's no if you, people know how to find me if they really want to ask questions. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very easy. Kaplock at stanford.edu. And, and Rodolfo, thank you very much for chairing, for stepping in. And, uh, and it really has been a great dynamic session. And uh, I would just like to thank the audience again, I think, for tuning in again. So have a nice weekend, everyone. Uh, Michael, well-deserved. <laughs> <So, laughs> I know it's working daytime, but have a, have a drink or a beer or coffee, strong coffee. <laughs> yeah. And we will see you all next week. I'm ready for a beer. <laughs> have a good weekend, you guys. Yeah, and thank you for staying, uh, delaying your dinner. So. <laughs> no problem. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you for attending. Bye. -bye.